Okay, thank you, Kenan. All right. Right, um, so I, I have two hats, and so just to amplify the background a little bit, I'm the coordinator of the neuroscience graduate program in Illinois, which means I'm an advocate for students and hence my interest in the Carnegie Initiative. And I also have a research associate position in the Department of Entomology. I study uh, the behavior and organization of ant colonies, and somehow these things are mutually related, really. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, a, a disclaimer first, if any of you read the abstract that was posted online, um, that was a waste of time because at the time I wrote that for Ken and I didn't really know what we were doing or how I was fitting in, and I'm still kind of figuring that out, actually. Um, but what I'm going to do is uh, try and briefly introduce you to what the CID was and then uh, just talk about a few ideas that were discussed as part of uh, our program's work with the CID and our interactions with other programs. Okay, usual PowerPoint. If this were a Mac, my things would be lined up. Okay, so um, the, the Carnegie Initiative on the doctorate was uh, a five-year effort launched by the um, Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching to examine how doctoral education is done in this country and how it could and should be done. And their, uh, their interest ex extended beyond the doctorate to other professions too. So within the doctorate, they, they took six fields, one of which was neuroscience, and there were, um, I think it was 10 uh, core neuroscience programs involved in this. And um, so what we did was talk amongst ourselves and then meet um, representatives from each program at the Carnegie Foundation. And um, the delegates from each program were always faculty and students together. Uh, so we'd meet and talk. And we were supposed to just question all aspects of doctoral education, that is, examine what our programs were doing, compare ourselves with what other programs were doing, and try to make our doctoral training intentional, meaning not doing what's been done for the past 500 years because it's the way it's always been done, but actually trying to um, match student development to some kind of real need. Okay, so I... I tried to say that there were kind of two parts to this. The work of the programs was to talk and think and brainstorm, and this propaganda here should be in quotes, but um, the Carnegie Foundation people actually kind of gently push some ideas on us to maybe shape our thinking and get us started. One was this ideal of the stewards of the discipline, the, the PhD, is somewhat admitted to this, uh, these sacred ranks who cares for, nurtures their own discipline, makes sure it goes forward in a good way. And also, um, they kind of suggested strongly that students should be involved in thinking about these things and shaping their own future. Okay, so that's what it was. And the results, um, th there are a couple of books that the Carnegie Foundation published, one which I'd recommend is called The Formation of Scholars. And then the rest of the results are sort of in the programs that participated. And I'm, I'm sorry to say this effort kind of ended in 2006, 2007. And our demographer would understand that in PhD programs, there's surprisingly a rapid turnover, and so the institutional memory fades quickly. So there was a lot of good energy. Um, a lot of that has dissipated. Several of us are trying to look for avenues to keep that going. Okay, so now this is just a set of some of the main topics we discussed. So what is the PhD? We were supposed to just go down nuts and bolts. Why do we have this thing? And ask for what is the student being prepared? And what are the characteristics of the sex, uh, successful graduate student? And when the Carnegie Foundation people asked us these questions, nobody could answer them, even though you know, we're all immersed in this business. Um, so some ways they tried to prompt us were to say, well, does the PhD graduate know something? Do they have certain habits of mind? What skills? And um, it's all very nebulous. We all have sort of an idea of what a successful PhD is, but it's really hard to pin down. 
Um, a lot of things we discussed were for what is the student not being prepared. So um, PhD students do research, but what they're not getting trained in is mentoring or managing a lab or often teaching or grant writing when 5% will get funded or how to be a good member of a committee or a colleague and a collaborator. And that's a lot of what actual faculty, anyway, are supposed to be doing. Um, we, we had a couple, uh, a couple of models of the PhD that emerged from our discussions. And first, I'm, I'm going to show you the old model. So one, a, a theme here is that um, scientific training has changed through time. The jobs have changed through time. And the question is, um, have, have our PhD programs really kept up in any way? So here's, here's the first one. This is a good old days model where a white male would go into a PhD program and go out on one career path to an academic institution. So that's a success and everybody's happy. And the current model that we're trying to think about is you have people from a whole bunch of different backgrounds coming in and doing this thing called a PhD, which qualifies you to go out and do more stuff, and that we should be actively thinking about and encouraging our students to choose one of many different possible career paths and uh, create their own. And we're not doing this that well yet. It's a nice idea. One obstacle to that diversity of careers is the way that funding agencies, as we just heard about the NIH, how they're the guerrilla employer, well, funding agencies shape the training and research. So success for the new doctor comes with getting major grants, and that's how you launch and maintain your career. Accordingly, there's pressure to do a certain kind of research. And this is, you know, well, in a number of ways, self-perpetuating. What I was thinking of here is uh, if you apply to NIH for an institutional training grant, they want to know how many of your faculty already got NIH grants and how many of your alumni are successful NIH uh, grantees. And so the mark of success is, is just doing more of the same. Um, yeah, we asked how science is done. We like to train people to do science, and um, this, this is really an inadequate slide. Um, I, I just said, well, science is done in two different arenas, and it's done in various ways within the academic arena and done in different ways within the corporate arena, and we could talk much more about how, I don't know, how different sort of scientists approach their problems. Um, so anyway, science is done in many different ways. And we're not necessarily uh, cognizant of the ways in which science is done or how people should be trained to do that. And you know, there's a textbook scientific method, which I think is uh, a little too restrictive. OK, and that leads me to this. So I'm taking off the neuroscience hat now and just for a moment putting on the um, ant researcher hat. And just one of my pet peeves is that theory in biology, I think, should be very important. And the standard scientific method that people learn out of a textbook says hypothesis or observation, hypothesis, experiment, and go back to the hypothesis and do another experiment. So there's no room in there for the theory. Everybody actually does have a theory. Usually it's only implicit and not explicitly stated. And I'm going to vent my enlarged spleen here. One good theory will eliminate a few billion hypotheses that you really don't need to test. And so um, we need more of that. But it's hard to implement because theorists and experimentalists often have a hard time talking to one another because they have such different goals and approaches. Most biologists, in part because this is what they get funding for, do experiments and have little understanding or training in theory. And frankly, a lot of theory is lousy, too. So we need more people interested in theory to do it better. And, and when I say lousy theory, I mean nice equations that really have nothing to do with the real world or the system that's being studied. OK, so that's uh, a few things that we talked about. And uh, really, what you should take home from the CID experience is we need constant vigilance. Just look at where we are, actually, where we want to be, actually, and
how to get there, which is not easy to figure out. Thanks.